Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Green, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, and welcome to all of you, whether it's in person or online. In collaboration with Yazda and the Zovigian Partnership, uh, we are proud to help release this important report entitled, Collapse Security Threatens the Future of Yazidis and Minorities in Sinjar. Today's discussion will explore the important security challenges and obstructions to long-term stability as well as suggested policies for immediate action by national and international stakeholders. When ISIS launched its genocidal campaign and crimes against communities of faith in Iraq and Syria in 2014, it targeted the Yazidi ancestral homeland in, in Sinjar as part of north, northwestern Iraq. Thousands, many thousands of Yazidis were victims of mass execution, mass rape, systematic sexual slavery, and forced religious conversion. Yazidi villages, homes, and places of worship were destroyed. More than 2,500 kidnapped Yazidi women and children are still missing. These women and children must never be forgotten, and the lasting threats against the Yazidi people should not be overlooked or taken lightly in any way. During my time at USAID, providing humanitarian assistance to persecuted religious communities and advancing religious freedom were top priorities for our work. The vital assistance to help victims of religious genocide started in northern Iraq, where ISIS committed barbaric acts against Yazidis, Christians, Shias, and other communities. In July 2018, at the request of the Vice President, I traveled to Iraq with a U.S. government delegation to visit ethnic and religious communities in that part of the country. During the visit, we met with Yazidi families displaced from Sinjar IDP camps. The stories we heard from those mothers who lost their sons and daughters were heartbreaking and truly unforgettable. I often tell people of all the experiences that I had at USAID, meeting with Yazidi mothers and meeting with Rohingya families were the two most striking and shattering experiences that I had. In my trip to the Middle East, we also met with religious and local leaders as well as faith-based and local NGO representatives to try to identify the best way to provide what these communities needed and to partner with those who are working directly on the ground and in communities. I'm delighted that we have Yazda with us today on this panel, one of the instrumental partners with whom we partnered very closely. Sadly, the absence of security is hampering humanitarian assistance, justice mechanisms, infrastructure, and strategic development, as well as shaping the geopolitical positioning of Sinjar. I look forward to a fruitful discussion today among the experts on these important issues. Nadine Menza, President of the International Rel Religious Freedom Secretariat, Haider Elias, President and Co-Founder of Yazda, and Lynn Zovigian of the Zovigian Group, who will moderate this discussion. We know that this conversation will not only shed light on how regional and international actors, including the United States, can help all communities in Sinjar to live in peace, security, and rebuild lives and livelihoods. But before we hand this over to the panelists, I'd like to welcome Deputy Assistant Secretary for Press and Public Diplomacy and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Iran and Iraq, Ms. Jennifer Govido, to give us some remarks. We're grateful that she's taken the time to be with us on this important topic this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and working with all of you to ensure that the plight of Yazidis and others is never forgotten, and again, never downplayed and never overlooked. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to start by thanking the Wilson Center, Yazda, and the Zavijian Partnership for the opportunity to speak today about Sinjar and the recovery of the Yazidi community. The United States does continue to prioritize the recovery of all communities that were subjected to genocide and other atrocities by ISIS. It's been more than eight years since ISIS's campaign of terror swept through Sinjar and other parts of Iraq and Syria. Yet much of Sinjar still lays in ruins and over 200,000 Yazidis are still unable to return to their homes. The reconstruction, 
security and overall stability of Sinjar are critical to the recovery of the Yazidi community and a priority for the United States. We have emphasized and will continue to emphasize this as we meet with Iraqi officials. Whenever we speak with Iraqi authorities, including the KRG, about issues impacting the Yazidi community, we take our cues from the Yazidi community itself. So I want to especially thank Yazda and the Zovigian Partnership for this timely paper on the security challenges in Sinjar. As the report notes, the presence of multiple armed groups, including the PKK, a US designated terrorist organization, and Iran aligned militias, which we unfortunately have seen out in force today, create an insecure, unstable environment that inhibits or prevents access by humanitarian actors, reconstruction activities, and basic governance. In October 2020, the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government took an important step toward addressing this and other challenges in Sinjar by signing the agreement on the restoration of stability and normalization in Sinjar. The Sinjar agreement was a welcome step in the right direction, but both Baghdad and Erbil did not consult the Sinjaris before or during its signing. It cannot be implemented effectively nor improve the lives of Sinjar's residents if it does not receive buy-in from the local community, including those who are displaced and hope to one day return. The US government has been urging the Iraqi government and the KRG to consult and coordinate with all Sinjaris as they work toward the agreement's implementation. As this paper notes, the longer we go without any meaningful improvement to conditions in Sinjar, the more difficult it becomes for Yazidis and other Sinjaris to see a future in Iraq. We're seeing a surge of Yazidis leaving Iraq because of this. We are pressing Iraqi leaders at every opportunity to address the situation in Sinjar. Ultimately, Iraqis need to form a new government in Baghdad to make meaningful progress on this and so many other issues. Toward that end, we are urging Iraqi leaders to engage in a sincere and inclusive dialogue that leads to a political compromise and most importantly, does not lead to further violence. In the meantime, we are urging the Iraqi government to appoint a mayor of Sinjar in consultation with the Yazidi community and the KRG and to implement the Yazidi survivors law, which received funding through the food security law that passed in June. We also need to rein in armed groups operating outside of state control and take other measures to improve conditions for the Yazidi community and other Iraqis in need. We will continue to press the Iraqi government to fund the local security force, put more funding toward reconstruction in Sinjar and take other measures to bring long-term security and stability to Sinjar. When I spoke last month at the Free Yazidi Foundation event to commemorate the genocide, I encouraged the Yazidi community to continue engaging and to present their ideas to us, and most importantly, to the Iraqi government. In that light, I am so glad to see this paper. It's full of great ideas that should be and will be explored further. I look forward to reading the next one in the series. The United States will continue to support the full recovery of the Yazidi community a critical component of Iraqi society and one that enriches Iraq's cultural heritage and diversity. The Yazidi community has demonstrated its resilience throughout Iraq's history, and I have no doubt that it will thrive in Iraq again. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you here today, and I look forward to listening to the panel discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lynn Zovigian. I am delighted and honored to be moderating this important panel today. I'd like to begin by thanking the Wilson Center and Marissa Khurma for allowing us the opportunity to create this very important state, stage for discussion. I'd like to thank Ambassador Green for his very important remarks to kick us off, and Deputy Assistant Secretary Jennifer Cavito, your remarks are not only important, they are deeply reassuring. Clearly, we are today amongst friends. I'd like to also welcome our two important speakers, 
Haider Elias, dear long friend and brother, dialing in and joining us today from Sinjad. Haider, thank you for being with us. This space could not be complete without Sinjad and the Yazidis in this room. And today, I know that you have very important remarks to share with us on behalf of Yazda and the community. And my dear friend and longtime collaborator, Nadine Mayenza, the president of the International Religious Freedom Secretariat, who has been working on this matter for years and brings with us her wisdom, her experience, and very important remarks. I'm very grateful to everyone, and I'd like to begin by setting the tone, beginning with why are we talking about security today? I've just flown into DC, and I haven't been to DC in the last few years. And one question that always comes up in my meetings with members of State Department and congressional offices is, Lynn, what is the ask? And today, I would like to begin by answering that question for all of us. The ask is that there is nothing else that we can ask for if we do not get security right. And this is why it is not only a pertinent topic, it is not only overdue, it is indispensable and is the prerequisite of all. And what do we mean by security today? We are not just talking about having secure episodes to get a little bit down here and there. We're not talking about creating a steady state that is manageable or that is the best that we can all do. I'd like to raise the bar and clarify that what we mean by security is that it be a trusted, inclusive, public asset that all Sinjaris can count on, that is implemented with full accountability by national stakeholders with a strong hand from the international community to make sure that no one falls through the cracks. That is how we are clarifying and defining security. And I'd like to begin with remarks, with, with perspective from our friend Haider. Haider, security and the lack of security, the chronic absence of security, has, is felt by families and community every single day in Sinjar. Can you bring that to life for us? What does the inhumanity of lack of security look like? Thank you, Lynn. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear, sir. Thank you. Great, great. Well, thank you for, for asking that question. Uh, thank you. I want to thank everybody for being here today. This is really important uh, for all of us. Um, Yazidi community have been petrified, have been, have been terrified for, for, for many, many decades, not just this recent ISIS attack, but, you know, hundreds of years ago by Ottoman Empire and even by the Iraqi army back prior to World War II and also by Saddam Hussein back in 1976 and a little bit before that, and also in 2007 by Al-Qaeda that uh, they blew up. Fortrex was considered the, the largest explosive bombing in the history of Iraq war in 2007. It was in my hometown and the recent one by ISIS. So when we talk about the security, uh, Yazidi people have been traumatized for, for, for many decades and they remember all of that. Uh, either through stories or some of them uh, throughout their lifetime, they've seen many events. And it's really difficult for them to get over the fact that in 2014, when, when they woke up one day on August the 3rd, that they found nobody to protect them, but the ISIS to replace the checkpoints and attacked those families and abduct thousands of men, women, and children and killed many people in the same day. So when we talk about uh, the security and the sense of security here in Sinjar, we have a lot of people are asking the question if 
if we go back to Sinjar, are we going to be uh, left vulnerable again in case there is any other attack? Because uh, the Yazidis are still uh, afraid that ISIS might come back from Syria and from other places. We have large detention facilities. We have a whole camp that holds about 70 3,000 plus uh, refugees, a lot of them from ISIS member families. But uh, for the Yazidis, they asked the question of betrayal. The security forces did not protect them in 2014. They go back, they asked the question of conflict between multiple militia groups in Sinjar. And unfortunately, a lot of Yazidi family believes that all these militia groups outside of Sinjar are friends, inside of Sinjar are enemies. And the result of the conflict is uh, killing Yazidi innocent people, especially social activists and those who are well known in the community. And it's really terrifying for the Yazidi families. The second thing is a lot of Yazidi mothers are worried about their teenagers when they go back to Sinjar, then, then might be brainwashed and be joining uh, uh, these militia groups and leaving their education. And it's really uh, one of the worst thing can happen to a mother to see uh, her young child uh, join these groups could see ended up in jail or killed or joining a very bad group. And uh, so many, so many other reasons that, that scares the Yazidis to, to be very cautious when, when thinking about living in Sinjar again. And uh, also, as we see just recently in, in the month of August, nearly 3,500 Yazidi young men and women crossed the border of Greece trying to, to seek refugees in Salem. And, and the month of September alone was almost as much as, just as many as the August, but a lot of them got cut and deported back uh, due to intense security and the border patrol of, of Greece and the region. Um, so it's really, you know, it's a very good question, but it's very, it, it comes with a lot of, a lot of, uh, issues with it. I could talk and talk about what a security looks like for Sinjari people uh, for hours. You know. Hyder, thank you very much for that. And, and this is why writing this policy paper was so important, because the question of security is not only complex in the nature of the insecurity, but also in the, in, in, in the multiple dimensions of consequences that it causes, and how that is felt day in and day out by Yazidis, by all minority groups in Sinjar. I'd like to contextualize, Haider, a bit what you are saying by, by, by making it very clear that Sinjar is incredibly unstable and the political inaction that has become the way we think about Sinjar all the time can easily make us think that it is static, that because there is no action, nothing is changing. But the reality of the situation is that inaction is creating ample space for the wrong players to go in, appropriate, occupy, and dramatically change the face of Sinjar. And the worry is to what extent is it going to end up being permanent collateral damage for all. And so today, to treat Sinjar as a post-conflict environment would be a very serious mistake. And, and, I, and I think it is very important that we, that, that we really understand, well, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Nadine, can you, can you talk to us more about how, what are the consequences right. of saying, of choosing a policy of inaction when it comes to security and lack of security in Sinjar today? It does seem the policies appear to be de-escalate and manage, just keep everything the status quo. And, and as Lynn mentioned, 
Um, you know, and I think even as a Deputy Assistant Secretary, Jen Gavado mentioned that, you know, the longer this goes on, the harder Sinjaris and Yazidis see a future for themselves in Iraq. The, managing and de-escalating is not a policy that is sustainable for, for Sinjar. And um, so, as you mentioned, you know, this is not a post-conflict environment. Sinjar con continues to be a militarized conflict zone with all of these um, armed forces on the ground. And I think, you know, it's easy for us, I mean, we don't know what that looks like because most of us hasn't, haven't lived this um, ourselves. But what it means is humanitarian services cannot safely and consistently come into the area. Humanitarian goods cannot be safely sourced, distributed, stored. Mobile medical clinics can't function. People can't get medical care. Mass graves cannot be effectively and safely exhumed. Genocide evidence cannot be collected. Local police and enforcement agencies cannot effectively function. Local police bo bodies cannot organize civil society life. Government of Iraq, the KRG, cannot rebuild and invest. Um, roads, bridges, not, not as effective, not safe. Demining is still a problem. Um, so, you know, you can go continue to go on. Agriculture can, can't continue, can't, the, the work can't be done because of the bombing and the different things going on in those areas. So, you know, as the report, I'm mean, going to quote from the report, safety and stability remain dangerously compromised due to the chronic and growing presence of armed groups and militias. So, I, I mean, I think the growing word is an important one, that this isn't static. Um, you know, at least 11 on the ground, and that's conservative. I've heard other numbers even higher because some of them have subgroups and, and so forth. You know, Sinjar also still has the threat of ISIS, so, you know, and other is Islamist forces in, in the area. And Turkey continues airstrikes, killing and wounding civilians, adding to this instability and, of course, to the trauma. So I wanted to talk real quick about um, just the, you know, I know that um, Deputy Assistant um, Secretary Jen Gavado had mentioned, you know, the PKK, and certainly we all agree that PKK should not be on the ground in Sinjar. But, but what the complication becomes the Sinjar resistance units, which are the YBS, the Yabisha. Um, they're, you know, used by Erdogan as an excuse to continue to attack Sinjar um, and even threatening ground troops. But, you know, while the PKK no doubt helped create them and they had that, that long tie with them, you know, they currently deny any affiliation. And in fact, they're paid by the Iraqi government. So these aren't rogue forces. They are actually part of the structure of Sinjar. And they have strong support in the Yazidi community in Sinjar. And it's because they are members of the community. Most all of the members of the YBS are um, Sinjaris. They're all Yazidis. None of them are Turkish. None of them are Syrian. Um, the last time, as it was mentioned by Ambassador Green, that they put down weapons, I think, um, and Haidar mentioned too, you know, they, they um, were not protected. So there is, it is so important that we include um, Yazidis and Sinjari residents in their own security. And this has been a big problem. And so, you know, the Turkish airstrikes, um, 20 alone in February, um, I think um, we had read that over 60% 60, 60 of all the airstrikes um, include civilian casualties. In June, I think we all heard about the 12-year-old boy that was killed in his father's shop. You know, that's unacceptable. And of course, um, this airstrikes in Zako that were uh, outside of Sinjar, killing eight citizens, wounding 20, you know, that that, that received international outrage a little bit more than the, the attacks in Sinjar on that. I was glad to see the outrage. It was disappointing to know that that we, we've just processed Sinjar as just being, oh, it just happens there, but these are innocent civilians. And what we've seen, of course, is people coming in um, and trying to resettle and then having to leave again because of the uncertainty. And of course, some of it is, is some of the polling I saw was they're leaving because of the lack of services. But the lack of services is because the lack of security can't, the services just can't be consistent. So there's a lot of reasons people leave. But at the end of the day, it's because the security, you know, and, and, and because it's, 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 it's beyond the scope of most Sinjaris to be able to solve this problem, which is not, we're big in fans of empowering the Yazidi community to do everything, they should be running their own communities, but this is a time the international community needs to stand alongside them. And, and as you heard, I appreciated the strong um, comments from Deputy Assistant Secretary Jen Gavado in, in standing with them on security, because I do think this is a bigger issue than just asking them to solve it themselves, but to come alongside as the international community thinking through different policies. How can um, we better stand with them? How can we push back these governments from, you know, I mean, I think we saw today that the tax of Iran in, um, in Iraq, that um, UNAMI did a, a tweet saying um, that, you know, um, uh, that, that using this region as, you know, using Iraq as the region's backyard needs to end.
and what was the one, um, rocket diplomacy. diplomacy. Yes, to stop with the rocket diplomacy. I thought that was a, um, a really telling statement, one that, um, that, that, there, that I think the international community can help a, a different way forward to push away from this rocket diplomacy and move towards actually having talks, ha settling these problems, solving these problems, and so we can move forward with a, a secure place for the Yazidi community to go back to their homeland. And, and we need to, what, what is so important is when we are looking at all of these moving parts to appreciate that everything is time critical. Mm -hmm. Because if we are now in this paper proposing a blueprint for how to move forward, that blueprint is going to expire very quickly if we don't act now. And, and, and the, the challenge that we are hearing here between Hyder's, um, Hyder's strong explanation of the inhumanity and the need to humanize Sin Sinjar on the one hand, and the significant consequences on the ability to have humanitarian aid effective on the ground, law enforcement to get anything done, mm -hmm. uh, the capacity to even start to think about socioeconomic development and investments. The, the, the challenges that we are facing today are that the breakdown is speeding up and it might get to a point where we just can't collect all of the big pieces anymore and all of the little pieces mm -hmm. anymore. And this is why we are very grateful to the Wilson Center for insisting alongside us that this is a topic that just can no longer wait. But I believe we also need to recognize it is massively overdue because a lot of the situation that we are in today really could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. But let's not go into that tangent mm -hmm. because we are not here to leave it at that. And let's come back to the blueprint that is relevant today, that has a window of opportunity that perhaps none of us can really define because we don't know when that window is going to, um, is, is going to close. But we have to, what we have done in this report, and we invite all of you um, to, to check it out, it is available for you on the Wilson Center website and on the Yazda website as well. And it is on social media, so the link for the Zoom also includes um, the, the, the report to download. We've gone into the details because it's so easy to stay at the high level and just talk about insecurity and, and lack of security. So let's walk you through some of these important details one by one. There are six recommendations that have been presented in this report, and I'd like to begin with the first one, which also Deputy Assistant Secretary Gavito has already importantly touched upon, and that is the Sinjar Agreement. Nadine, can we start there? Yes, absolutely, and I think that um, it was important for her um, also to frame it as it can um, be implemented without buy-in from the local community. And the mistake, the biggest mistake that was done with this agreement was the exclusion of the Yazidi community and the Sinjari community in general in, in drafting this um, agreement. Um, so at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, where I just finished uh, my fourth year as a commissioner and serving as chair the last year, we um, in, endorsed the agreement following the lead of the Yazidi community, knowing it wasn't perfect, but knowing that at least it was a way forward. And you know the, the the moving of the militia forces, the putting together of a Yazidi force of, of 2,500 Yazidi and local Sinjaris. To, 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 so there were a lot of pieces. You know, we saw that um, the implementation of a mayor being a, a big point of it, and, and I know that Deputy Assistant Secretary mentioned that. It was disappointing to see the government appoint um, the governor of Nineveh to be double-hatted as the mayor of Sinjar a little while back, and, and we did see a lot of um, opposition to that, and they ended up doing away with that idea, but it just kind of shows you how little there is in terms of thought for the Yazidi community to be involved in these kind of decisions. Um, but, so having said that, you know, there, there's disappointments with this agreement, but there, but there's a way forward with this agreement. And so we would love to see, um, the Secretary, we'd love to, I know you serve, I don't speak for anymore, but has made it clear they would love to see it, it move forward, but only if um, it includes the Yazidi community and the Sinjar community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one, one important also um, component that Deputy Assistant Secretary Gavito touched upon is funding. Yes. And, and Haider, I, I'd, I'd like to, we'd like to get your thoughts here because, you know, the government budget for um, Iraq has been proposed. 
it already does not include, for example, critical minority community um, requirements, for example, like budget for the Yazidi survivor law. And, and so budget is always a problem when it comes to getting things done. And can, you, can you talk to us about about the need for budget and, and what it entails from a perspective of security, please. Yes, thank you, Lynn. Well, uh, we actually, as you are aware of, in the past couple of weeks, I was uh, visiting Baghdad and meeting with uh, a lot of ambassadors uh, to talk about uh, one of the main topics was this budget and about the humanitarian efforts, also the security. Swedish ambassador, Australian ambassador, US and also Dutch ambassador, and all of them refer to the fact that the Iraqi government now has budget that enough to support its people. Uh, now, uh, those of us who were supporting were redirecting some of our efforts to other places like in Ukraine, Afghanistan, and other places that are more urgent. So it's really disappointing when we have the international community estimates that the Iraqi government has the budget, but the Iraqi government does not uh, provide that budget for important uh, issues for rebuilding reconstructions in Sinjar, for example. We have the Yazidi survivor law that uh, was established, it was drafted two years ago and. Uh, Recently, the most recent budget, it was uh, equivalent to $17 million. Uh, if, you, if you count the number of the Yazidi survivors based on the qualifications, uh, what constitutes a survivor would be a good number of people that will apply for this. We at YASDA provide recommendations for who is a survivor, who is not, and the money is not enough. The people who have long lines that they as the office every day, all day. And uh, when we count this budget, it's really not enough for like 10% of the, of the population. So we're asking that to uh, put pressure on the Iraqi government to provide more budget for this particular survivor. Problem. And also there is a Sinjar fund called, uh, there is a, was a committee recently been appointed by the governor. The governor of Mosul, of Nainawa, was in charge of the committee and was also about $15 million for uh, projects, reconstruction in, in the water system, the electricity, the houses, and all of that. So when you look at Sinjar, in addition to uh, the security problem, almost 80% of the houses in the south side of the Sinjar are destroyed. And uh, it requires any house at least $20,000 to be in Hadap and to, to, to be ready to, to live. Yeah. And so it's uh, devastating and it's disappointing that how Iraqi government is not prioritizing uh, the Yazidi issues in Sinjar. It's not about these days that are forming the government. It's not about the political conflicts in Baghdad. It has been like this since 2003 and even before that. So that's why we at Minority, we say that why we want to wait for the government to, uh, to form because it doesn't matter. I'm not sure if I answered the question, but there, there are so many. Thank you so much, Haider. And so, one of the big challenges is that budget is needed across the board. And so there are conflicts of interests on budget decisions because, because budget is finite. If budget goes to security, it won't go somewhere else. If it goes to housing, it won't go somewhere else. We've taken too long to take care of Sinjar where now everything is urgent. And so the compromise If I may add just one point. Please. Lynn. Ah. So you, you mentioned, you reminded me of the security and the budget. The budget for the security has been politicized on the agreement, on Baghdad agreements. Many of you are aware of this. Part of the, one of the main points was to uh, recruit 2,500 policemen and was required that all of them from, from Sinjari people. 
So the KRG, the KDP uh, KRG uh, imposed on the Iraqi government that it has to be uh, to 70 percent of of 2,500 has to be from the IDP camps because we don't want to have the Yazidis in Sinjar to be recruited and included in the in the police force for some reason. The fears, perhaps fears of Yapaji members being included, I'm not sure, but it's not a good idea. So even recruiting people in Sinjar have been politicized. Providing budget for the security has been politicized. And uh, as you mentioned, uh, formation uh, of the governments, putting mayor is the top uh, political issue between the KDP and, and the ZD people in general. The Baghdad doesn't, doesn't put that as a top priority, but it's bad for the Yazidis. The longer this takes, the, the worse it's going to get for us. Because um, a lot of Yazidis need to go back all the way to Kurdistan. Even those who have returned to Sinjar, they have to go back to Kurdistan and to IDP camps for public services. They need to uh, renew their documentations, identifications, marriage certificates, court certificates, and uh, anything that is related to, to, to their families, new birth or anything like that, they have to drive all the way to uh, Kurdistan. So that's, that's been politicized and it's discouragement of people to even go back, even those who have the courage to come back to Sinjar in, in the middle of these conflicts. And it's really discouraging uh, by political parties to, to have these people come back to Sinjar. Very understood. And, and to add also to that, Hyder, you know, the, the, with all of these non-state actors and armed, different armed groups, there's, this, there's been this demarcation mm -hmm. of, of, of territory, of physical space. And, and so the need not only to fund and recruit, but also to close all those non-state checkpoints that have been created uh, to, 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 um, to obstruct mobility mm -hmm. and obstruct the establishment of a security infrastructure is, is very important. I know we have important questions from also our audience and friends in the room with us. Um, so what I will do is invite um, our speakers to close on, on the remaining three recommendations in this paper and then open up the floor. The importance of inclusion mm -hmm. is a key theme mm -hmm. for us today, um, shared by all speakers, and I believe everybody in this room would agree that no solution that is not community-led is a viable solution. And this, not, this does not just apply to Sinjar. Um, but Nadine, could you talk to us about what that inclusion needs to look like mm -hmm. in the context of making those appropriate, th those, those safe and trusted security decisions and, and how do we hold that accountable? Right, so I think the re this paper has a couple important recommendations. One that establish and fund a multi-stakeholder task force for Sinjar with seats advocate, advocated to all of the community members. So you have the diversity of, of the representation there as well as the KRG government of Iraq, um, and ha have an independent mediator and secretariat to ensure that there is this convening happening. You know, I think that that is one of the, the, the missing components. And then the next thing would be is establishing and funding a local community-led grassroots independent monitoring and oversight body to track study, document, and address. So, you know, we've seen this even like you serve as an independent body that's kind of like a monitoring, you know, the State Department's religious freedom. And, you know, you kind of see that kind of, what if something like that with, with Sindra where you have an, an inclusive committee, but you also have this independent committee that's monitoring and reporting, you know, so there's some accountability because we all know that there's, um, that, that that would set up for a, a far more efficient way of moving forward. And so I, I really thought these were strong recommendations. And, and I think what becomes very important to say here is we're not here to be myopic with these solutions. The, the pain is that Sinjar does not have another precedence around the world, another conflict and or post-conflict zone that has done this right. right. And so the burden is that we have to innovate and we have to enable this with, with very little, very few examples of success stories. 
But if we do get this right in Sinjar, it will be very important for the rest of the world. And on, on, on that note, Haider, if I can turn to you on, on the final recommendation that we have on this paper, you know, you've talked about human rights. And I'd like, to, um, I'd like to close before we open the floor for questions with our last recommendation on the importance of human rights when it comes to security. Over to you. Thank you, Len. But it's it's really important to to look at the Yazidi issue as a human rights issue in general because we I, I understand that the a lot of other problems are occurring in other places in the world. We have Afghanistan, we have Syria, we have Nigeria, we have Ukraine, and uh, within Iraq we have multiple regions that are, are suffering from human rights violations and all of that. For the Yazidis. Uh, it's not, it wasn't a genocide and then it stopped and then it was, it was not a, a, an explosion and then that's it, we're deal, dealing with, uh, as uh, Lynn put it perfectly, it's not a post-conflict issue. It's like the genocide is ongoing and it's a, it's a human rights issue. It's a women's rights issue. It's a children's rights issue for, for, for the Yazidi people. They're not able to go back to their homelands and for the for the entire community, the demographic change is taking place because we now have eight years old generation that all of them from one to eight years old have never seen a building themselves. They lived in IDP caps. Today we have at least 196,000 within the tents and also additional 30,000 around, so uh, around these camps, so at least 225,000 Yazidis from Sinjar uh, living in outside of Sinjar homelands. Uh, it's, and it's difficult for them to, to go back. We think this is a clear human rights violations that has been politicized uh, in the, by the governments of the region. And for the Yazidis, it's almost never happened that when you have IDP, and uh, IDP families stayed in these camps for eight years. You you can think of refugees like Palestinians and others. They've, they've done that for a while, but IDPs never happened uh, as far as I can tell. So one of the recommendations would be, Nadine put it perfectly, you know, the, the public administration, the, the mayor, it's really important to, to sit in a table and put their political conflicts on the side. If you really want the best interest of the Yazidis, you do not impose a candidate that is really unpopular and that is really uh, unwanted by people, that is really involved in corruption in the past. One of the candidates, people really didn't want them and, and political parties are trying to impose them. They used to be uh, mayors of sub-districts in Sinjar, and they were involved in corruptions. And so uh, that's one of the one of the issues. If we have we all have to put pressure on both KRG and the Iraqi uh, central government to put their differences on the side and think about the Yazidis to bring someone who's technocrat, who is not partisan at least at first, and then to build the team around that uh, independent personality and then, then the elections can take place and whichever party can win if they want democratically and, and with, with prosperity. So that's one thing. And also the security, uh, it's really important to have Yazidis in charge of their security. That's one of the also solutions um, because in 2014, Believe me, there wouldn't be any genocide if the Yazidis was in charge of the security. We wouldn't have to deal with 2,763, as of today, missing people, mainly men, women and children. We wouldn't have to do this. We wouldn't have to uh, deal with our loving ones, our, our loved ones that are killed, uh, kidnapped, raped, all of that. This all happened because of lack of security and because of the portrayal and and without even telling the population uh, they left the region without telling the population that we left 
they lied to them. They prevented them from fleeing from their villages for, for, for weeks, for months. For those families who would pass through the river to Kurdistan, if they had anything, any signs of moving, they would be returned, they would be turned out. But so security is really important that Yazidis secure themselves by themselves. Because, you know, then this is one of the main important things. Thank you so much. Very important words, Haider. I'd like to open the floor for our friends here today, and beginning with Marissa, who I know has an important question for us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Lynn, uh, for moderating this important discussion, and thanks to all of you uh, for being here today and for our online audience for uh, tuning in. This is a very important report. And we look forward to working with you on um, more reports that I know are in the pipeline. So um, I've heard um, Haider talk about uh, going to Baghdad, talking to ambassadors, mostly named Western countries. And, and my simple question is here, where is the rest of the region? Um, where are um, other regional governments on this? Are they being engaged? Um, or is this too sensitive an issue to bring up with Baghdad, with the government in Baghdad? Um, and then both Nadine and Haider also touched upon, you know, more and more Yazidis leaving Sinjar and the IDP camps. Um, how are these camps being run? Who are, who are the entities or governments funding these camps? Um, and who's providing security at these camps? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Two very important questions. Um, Haider, I, I know you and I talk about the first question very often. Over to you for, for remarks, and, and, and I might add a couple points as well. Yes, you're right. I think uh, the only two people I've talked about, it's myself and Lane, about involving the regional ambassadors. Uh, uh, on the issues of the Yazidis and minorities. We've talked about it since last year. We're trying to organize a campaign to have the Egyptians, Kuwaitis, Saudis, and others. I know they're not gonna, we're not gonna get the initiative from them, but we, we will have to jump in because we're the one that need help. So uh, we've been campaigning, we've been planning basically and still brainstorming and trying to reach out to, to many of these ambassadors. I myself have reach out to at least eight of them and haven't got a clear uh, answer yet or a decision where they're really willing to cooperate with us. But this is not going to stop. Uh, with Zoviran Partnership and Yazda, where we're trying to set a campaign that it's going to involve many of these uh, diplomatic missions and also they will have to go back to their governments and see if we can rally you know, around us a lot of people. That's for first question. I think uh, Lynn can elaborate to that. The second one was who's providing security for the IDP, right? Um, a lot of, uh, nearly 100% of the IDPs are in Kurdistan region of Iraq. And um, the area is, uh, it's safe somehow uh, for those uh, families who live inside the camp. Uh, they're a gated camp. They have fence camped around them and also it's a one checkpoint. It's one way in and it's the same way out. So it's secured by the security forces in Kurdistan. And uh, so far the camps have been safe or in general, safe from explosions maybe uh, for individuals, individual crimes, separate abductions, and things like that, they happen every once in a while. So families do not feel that safe, but uh, it's, it's different than Sinjar. I think it's a bit safer than Sinjar. And for the, the last part of the second question is that the World Food Program, the UN, the UNDP, and and nearly 64 other NGOs, including Yazda, are providing uh, programs, projects for uh, local, for developments, economic developments, for case management, psychosocial therapy. For Yazda, we do a lot of developments in here. We educate people. 
leadership, education, uh, healthcare, and, and all of this. We provide culture preservation projects and things like that. But we have nearly 64 NGOs just in the Hook area with a lot of museums. Lynn, back to you. Thank you so much, Haider. And I know that um, we have 10 minutes left to close off. Um, so, Marissa, you know, thank you for your question. And actually, I will just quickly state that I recently wrote a, a short paper for the Wilson Center that, that, that talks about the need to bring in the regional governments to provide very direct support and diplomatic empowerment to the Yazidi people, to the minority groups, and, and to national stakeholders. And so I will, um, I, I, you can find the paper online also um, at the Wilson Center, on the Wilson Center website, just in the interest of time. I would like to invite a couple more questions um, in, in the room. I know that we have a question from a member of our audience. Um, over to you, sir. If you have a question, okay. Hello, do you hear me? Is it working? Or do I have to mute something. Is it working? Okay. Thank you. Yes. My name, uh, my name is Dakhil Shamu Elias, but uh, not Haider's nephew. <laughs> I'm his friend, <laughs> my good friend. Okay. I have one point and one question. I think uh, talking about the uh, IDP camps, uh, the youth are losing hopes. That's why they are leaving and the security one of the region, definitely. So that's one thing that I want to touch. That I have one uh, short question, one question. Why Sinjar agreement is not uh, implemented, that's one. And a question for uh, Nadine. Should, uh, don't you think that US government should involve more, get involved more in, uh, in that? Thank you. Over to you, Nadine. Yes. I. Um I do believe um, the U.S. government should play the biggest role, and I, and I understand a lot of that is is um, hidden from us, you know, um, in order to not undermine the, the the central government. So, you know, I hope the U.S. government is um, interacting and in pushing the Iraq government to move forward with the Sinjar Agreement. So, it's like I said, it's hard for us to always know what exactly is happening um, on the diplomacy side, but I do believe the U.S. has an important role to play in in, in all of this to help push. Um, the, the governments in Iraq in the right direction and also to push back some of these um, other actors that are causing so much violence there. Thank you so much for that important question, Mr. Elias. And, and over to Ms. Marina Ottaway. Please, the floor is yours. I hope this works. Okay. Uh, my, I have not read the report, unfortunately. So what I'd like is some clarification is concerning to whom you address these recommendations. Because you, we are dealing with, an, with a region that we know is extremely fragmented in terms of authority and in terms of who makes, who can make things happen. I mean, the, the recommendations are good. It's, the problem is not the recommendations. But who is there on the other side that can make at least some of these things happen? Because I'm not sure it is the government in Baghdad that has somewhat limited control in those areas. It's not a KRG. It's not, you know, who is it? Because the sort of, those recommendations to be implemented need agents. And it's not clear to me who the agents who can make it happen are. What an excellent question. Thank you so much for that important remark. I, I will go ahead and answer um, and, and answer this by by saying, you know, Ms. Ottaway, we, we were supposed to be presenting this in Baghdad mm -hmm. back in July, mm -hmm. and the security breakdown um, canceled this, this convening. And I, 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 I will say what needs to be said. I mean, we, this was with the office of the prime minister. And, and his team and, and the prime minister were committed to hosting and having this important discussion. Um, the security breakdown in Baghdad made other things, other forms of insecurity a bigger priority. We moved the event and it didn't happen and we moved the event and it didn't happen. And we got to a point where as Haider perfectly said, we cannot wait for the Iraqi government 
to take care of the minority communities of Sinjar. And this is why we are now here. This paper is meant for the, the direct involvement of national stakeholders held accountable by the international community. And I say that knowing full well that that design is already disempowered because the national stakeholders are not empowered and have a, a complete breakdown of security and rule of law and geopolitical, um, ge geopolitical standing that doesn't enable them to be the counterparts whom we need them to be. But that is not an excuse because at the end of the day, insecurity is within their borders mm -hmm. and it is the sovereign right and, and human right of, of governments and citizens to, to at the very least get basic security up and running. And so you, you say it painfully well. The problem is we today do not and are not in a position to identify a capable stakeholder to take this on. And that is the reality of the situation. I do want to just add that um, this, this, the methodology of this paper was with, with interviews and, and, and meetings and a lot of, how long did it take to put this together? This was a three-month effort. And, you know, so, and I know because actually my, my daughter helped draft some of this mm -hmm. independent of me, and so you see this is a close issue with our family. And um, so this is, these are coming from the Yazidi community, and so this isn't an independent, like we're telling you know, the Yazidi community or Haider. Haider in, in, in um, the team um, did a deep dive with community leaders, with community members, to put this information together and come up with, with the ideas from the stakeholders themselves on the ground, which I think makes this report all the more important, that this is a Yazidi report about a way forward in Sinjar was to be to the Prime Minister's office, but, but now still is given to the Prime Minister's office, but is going to need the international community um, and other stakeholders that have influence there to be able to stand and, and, and be a voice. And I think really give Sinjar a voice, because the whole point of this is the Sinjaris themselves. You know, Yazidis, of course, because it's their homeland, but also the others that live there, whether they be Sunnis, Christians, um, uh, uh, Turkmen, who, who, all, all minority voices to have a, a say in the future of their homeland. Absolutely. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, one of us also at the table. Um, Miss uh, Geneviève Abdo, please, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for your presentations and for your very important remarks. And my, my question, I'll be brief, is very sim similar to Marina's. And that is, I mean, someone mentioned in this conversation that there's the lack of government formation in Iraq is one of the causes. And um, so I wanted to ask a similar question, which is it, we have seen during the years that the prime, current prime minister all the obstacles that he's had with the security situation from the Iranian militias and so forth. But can you tell us a bit, uh, you've spoken a lot about the security obstacles, but could you tell us a bit about the political obstacles? So are there any political factions at all that have been responsive to this issue that perhaps the international community could engage and try to um, work as some sort of you know, mediator to help with this issue. Are there any any political actors at all um, in Iraq now, um, irrespective of the lack of government formation? Because I think, unfortunately, we don't. There doesn't seem to be any um, potential for a government formation at this point, and you know, the situation could go on now for several months ahead. So that was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Abdo. I'd like to turn the floor to our friend Haider. Um, and Haider, just to make sure that you were able to hear Ms. Abdo, you know, the question is, is there a political player who is amenable and is responding or in a strong position to respond and take the lead to mediate and enable security at a time when government formation is um, is, is very challenged and, and going likely to be very delayed. 
I'm sorry, was it about the security? Was it about the forming the, the public yes, administration? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll repeat the question, Hyder. Apologies um, with, the, with the bad sound. The, the question from Ms. Abdo is, can, is there a responsive political player who can take the lead in mediating security today? Uh, I think uh, it's very hard to to find uh, to find a, a political uh, actor here, uh, other than I personally uh, found President Barham Saleh was really uh, looking into finding a real solution for for Sinjari people. Other than himself, it's really difficult. I've been it's really difficult to find someone. I've been in KRG. Been back and forth between the, the players, especially those who are involved in, in Sinjar agreements, and each one of them sends me to the other, so it's, it's their fault, and then I come back. Uh, the problem is that we have lack of political will from three different main uh, actors. We have lack of political will from Sunni uh, politicians, do not want the Yazidis to go back because they fear retaliation because they fear that Daesh, ISIS was 100% from Sunni communities and when Yazidis become strong, they will keep the Sunni community members out of the region or they will retaliate, that's one. So those parliamentary members in Iraq as Sunni communities are really against having Yazidis taking control of Sinjar. Lack of Shia groups, political groups, we're not talking about people, we're talking about politicians. Shia wanted to build a foundation for Shia groups in Sinjar first, making sure before Yazidis uh, are settled. Now, if you go back to Sinjar city, you'll find repairments of the Shia mosques, houses of worships, shrines, temples. It is increasing, and we have some of the very important positions in, in administration in Sinjar are held by Shia political groups. Um, so the, the, the in charge of the granary, the Water Foundation, I think, trying to find out last time I talked to the Sinjar people two weeks ago that they hold very important positions. So Shia Hashid, for example, is helping with that, making sure that Shia also gets, gets some ground control before Yazidis go back. We have KDP is really not wanting Yazidis to go back there because they fear lose of controlling the people. Uh, uh, if they go back there, Yazidis will take control. And that's every one of these three groups fear that the Yazidis will, will take control, not them. So it's really not in the best interest of, of those three uh, main actors to let the Yazidis go back as fast as uh, possible. As I've been advised by uh, some of my expert friends says, they have all the time on the world. So that's why they, they wait, they filibuster. They, they, the longer it takes, the better it is for them. But it's disaster for the Yazidis. Imagine how much we suffer here in these IDP camps, the communicable diseases, you know, quitting their schools, teenagers, smoking early age, and, and, and drinking and drugs and prostitution. All of that is happening in these refugee camps. It's really a humanitarian disaster. But Politics, unfortunately, don't care about it, especially in Iraq. I don't know if I answered the question. I'm sorry. Thank you this so is much, Haider. This is, this is everything. This is the point. This is why we are here. Mm. And I know that we have run out of time, so I will take a half minute to close by saying thank you to Haider for saying what needs to be said, yes. and for Nadine for always powering those local voices, and I know that this is something we've always done together, and I know that we will remain committed to continuing to do that and empower our friends like Hyder and, and other community organizations on the ground. Massive thank you to the Wilson Center, Marissa, Ambassador Green, and, and the team for making sure that this is a safe space to say what needs to be said, and to Deputy Assistant Secretary Gavido from State Department and her team also here with us today for making it a point to, to amplify this. The reality is that security has become the excuse to delay everything.
But insecurity, the, the best friend of insecurity is time that is lost because it can never be regained. And I would like to end by saying that that we will be hosting another roundtable with the Wilson Center to talk about the, the, the next layer beyond security, which is the need for fair and equitable representation at the level of local public administration. Please join us next month. Details will be shared soon. In the meantime, we invite you to the Wilson Center website to check out our report, and all of us are here to keep this, this important discussion going and continuing to answer your very important questions. Thank you to all, and have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for making this happen.